Hi, I'm Adam from Impact Gamers, and this is the last retro remakes in the current series, and as such, will be slightly different. We're going to be looking at uh, Zelda role-playing games in general, where you have a character who's on a quest. Our quest is to go north, but we can't swim, and we can't access this boat yet. The fisherman tells us he's not selling the boat till he gets his fishing rod. So that begins our quest. We go off into his house, and we're faced with the first issue. It's dark. So we need to search around. We need to find torches. We can uh, have other characters help us uh, with our quest. We've got little side quests that will benefit us. And um, we're going to show you the aspects of making a role playing game like this. OK, let's get going. In Click Team Fusion, we've got the free edition here. Now, the free edition is limited. We can only have three separate levels. That's not too much of an issue because one level is going to be one area of the world. But what really limits us is we can only have 30 objects in the game. So in a role playing game, you will find different items to collect and different characters to meet. But the more characters to meet, the less items we'll be able to collect because of that 30 limit. In the full version, um, if you do enjoy using Click Team, I recommend getting the full version. You, you have pretty much unlimited uh, objects that you can add in there of different types. So uh, let's get going. So first of all, I'm going to just talk through how we set up our world. So I'm going to click on File and New for a new application. And I'm going to leave the application window. I'm going to leave it as the small 640 by 480. And the reason for that is I want to make a big world to walk around in. And so the smaller the frame, let's just resize this to a normal, a normal size. Uh, the smaller the frame, the smaller the, the viewing area, the bigger our world can be. And also in the window options, I will make it so that it resizes to fill the window display, uh, that it fits inside. We keep the aspect ratio, but I'm not going to anti-alias it. I'm going to leave it blocky because we're working at such a low resolution. So let's go into our frame. So you can do that by selecting it and on the top menu, choosing the frame editor or clicking the number next to it, either of those. And here we go. Now, this is a very, very small world. So let's expand it. So we're going to click on the frame itself in the workspace toolbar and change its size. If you click on any of the numbers here, you get a drop down. This little V is an arrow and you can set it to a larger number, but I'm going to go even bigger. So let me just resize this. I'm going to go into the thousands and I find that we can get up to about 10,000 um, to work well. But for this game, I'm going to work with 3,000, so not 8,000 there. And that gives us a nice big area. You, so you could go as high as 8,000 if you wanted. You might run into issues, but we'll cover that with the NPCs later. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to zone the world. In, you might have wastelands, you might have um, you might have village areas, forest areas. We're going to zone them and we're going to do that with quick backdrop objects. So if I insert a new object and go down to quick backdrop, it's a tiled or a mosaic of an image that we, we're looking for. So I can click down, I can resize it. And let's say up here, I'm just going to create a grass area. So I want to change it from solid color in its properties windows to motif. Then edit it, and I'm going to zoom in just by dragging the magnifier, clear it, and I'm just going to choose some kind of muted green colors. So we'll go with that one and do some flex in it with the brush tool, and then maybe some flex of a different color. Press OK, and then it gives us a nice grass effect. You could also, if you wanted, you could, uh, if we edit this again, you could actually use the transparent color to mean that you can overlay a grass effect on top of other areas so that it's half grass, half sandy to, to transition between areas. But for the moment, I'm just going to edit and I'm just going to refill my background. There we go, it's a grass area. Now, we haven't made an asset folder as we have with the other retro remakes for this because I want to introduce you to the library. So in the library, you can load it up at the bottom of the screen normally. That's where 
automatically starts. And if you don't have it, you can click View, Toolbars, and Library Window, Control R there. We're going to add the game that we've already made into the library, which allows us to use the objects from our game in a new game. So I'm right, right click in this area and we'll make a new um, folder. And it's just on my desktop. I have this folder called Xander. Okay. And let's call it Xander. Select that and our, either of these both both downloaded from our website, so from the Impact Gamers link from the beginning, and I've put them in folders. Uh, so into the game one, and then there's backgrounds. So what I can actually do is if I wanted the farm area, I could just pull and drop it from there, and then I can create, oops, farm area. Now what it's done, if you see, it's just resized it. It hasn't created, it's created it as a um, just, a normal backdrop so if so if i wanted a village area i could pull in the village ground and there it is um, and i can resize it to be the size i want and place it around so you, you want to fill up your whole area so add in some wasteland area and like i was saying before with the overlay um you can you can use one background object on top of another uh, with the seat with the transparency so that it kind of fades from one to the other um, and then there's some paths and some some other things like that that i can add in if you want to have more than one area the same the best thing to do is right click and clone the object a clone makes another copy if i resize this the original stays the same so i can set this to the size i want if I was to duplicate it or even just pull another one in, if I change one object, they all change. So if you see, as I change this one, the other one changes. So you can tell by unique names. And the other thing, when you're making a role-playing game, things can get very messy in the asset list, in this object toolbar. So we can, um, in this area, we can add some folders. So you can right-click on your frame and you can make a new folder and click on that right click on it and rename and you could call it backdrops or whatever you wish and if you just pull and drop then it just means that things sit nicely in that folder and as with anything if something's on top that shouldn't be on top you can right click and send it to back or if it's underneath you can right click and you can order bring to front and so you can work out that now, what I would recommend is that once you've positioned all of your areas just how you want it, it's a really good idea to lock them. And there's a quick way of doing that, clicking Arrange, Lock, and you can lock all the background objects at once, which means we're not gonna, we're not gonna accidentally move things and drag things. Uh, when you add some more in, so we could add another um, village area, it won't be locked, but once again, you can go to Arrange, Lock, Backdrop. And if you want to move something, the shortcut is holding Control and Shift and selecting something. And then once you're done, I would Arrange, Lock, Backdrop. Um, I haven't done it in a neat way, but hopefully you get the idea here. And it's up to your imagination of how you want to create your, your background there. So that's the first section. Let's save it. So file, save as. And let's just call it my RPG. Great stuff. So now that we've got areas set in our world, we're going to add in our character to work out how quickly we can move between areas. So we're going to insert a new object, active, press OK and drop down. Let's rename it. So in the about properties, let's call it P1 or player one or, you know, hero, because we're unlikely to have a second player in this game, but we'll leave it like that for the moment. And by default, the size is 32 by 32 pixels. And by default in the grid, if I click on the grid setup at the top, it's 32 by 32. And I would probably show the grid and snap to the grid and meaning that we can start to align things in straight lines very simply but if we do that 
we need to be aware that our character will need to fit through the gaps. And if we're going to make gaps an average of 32 pixels or the smallest, 32 pixels by 32 bit pixels as a gap in any fences or any obstacles to get through, our character needs to be smaller than that. So uh, we can resize it in the size and position here before we do the artwork and we can just type in and I'd probably take it down to about 28 uh, high by 20 wide or we can double click and use the size here and maybe make it 20 by 28 and apply. Let's clear it. Now I want to show you the technique I use to, um, to make animations and we'll cover that properly in the next section. But just for the start, don't go to much detail at all. So when you're drawing your character here, we're just looking for body proportions. So we're just looking for putting a head and if it's in the wrong place, you can use the selection tool and move it. Um, a body, so our heroine, she has a, sort of a blue a blue suit that she wears in our game to rescue Xander. Um, and then I'll just give her some dark blue leggings. Right, there we go. Let's just add some shoes. So we're talking basic, no eyes, no hair, just an outline like that. And it might be useful for the hotspot to make sure it's in the center of the player. Fantastic. Now this is gonna get used as a template um, later for, for other things. So I'm actually gonna right click and clone the object and pop it just at the area and rename it to template because our character designs are going to be based off this, this human size here. Now that we've got our, our player, we need to decide movement, make sure you've selected them. So you can right click on them and choose properties to jump to the properties window here and go to movement. And we want to change it from static to eight directions. Now the speed, if we were to run our application and use the arrow keys, far too quick in terms of size. I would drop it right down to maybe, let's try eight and run the application. That might be a fine walking speed. I think it might be slow for my quest. So I'm going to take it up to um, 12. Let's try that run application. And it's trial and error, whatever suits your game. Yeah, I'm much happier with that. Okay. So, what we'll do is we will uh, we will add a bit more of the artwork now. Now that it's not a template, now that we've got the template separate, we can add a bit more. So uh, give her her sort of blondy coloured hair. Oops, it's a bit brown. Um, and just give her some eyes. Useful to have eyes and a smile. There we go. Right, uh, so that there's our character. Press OK. Now, we want to be able to travel around the screen, so we'll just add our first bit of code in the event editor. New condition, that P1, and make sure you've got P1 because we've got the template there, which we're going to come back to uh, later on. P1. Position, test position. I don't want the player to be able to leave the world. So I'm just going to, rather than create a barrier around the world, I'm just going to go to position, test position, and select the four arrows pointing out of the play area and right click under the player and choose movement stop. But I want to get the scrolling working. So I click new condition and I will go special. I always want the storyboard controls. So right click under there, the scrollings to center the window position in frame relative to player one, make sure it's player one, not the template. Okay, so now if we run our application, we can now travel around the world. Now it doesn't look like we're traveling, so let's save this and add some animations, file and save. So we don't actually need to go all the way back into our frame editor. We can access the animations from the workspace toolbar by uh, right clicking and choosing edit the same way we would in the frame editor, right click on an object and click edit. Here we go. Now the stopped animation automatically plays when our player isn't moving. So what we can do is we can add a couple of uh, 
animations in. So I'm going to select frame one and press the plus. And I just think it's nice to kind of have a bit of a breathing movement. So I'm going to, and this is a technique we'll use a lot. We'll get the select tool. We will drag over the area we want to move. And so there you go, breathe in there. And then maybe on frame two, maybe just a head bob down. Now, if I choose direction options, I can choose to loop it. And if I press play, it looks like, I don't know what it looks like, but it, she's leaping about far too quickly. So I'm going to change the speed all the way down to about three. And I'm much happier with that. Now our player can go in eight different directions. We've only got an animation for direction zero to the right. So we're going to right click and copy that. Put it the other side, right click and paste. And then we're going to right click and flip horizontally and it will flip. If we right click on that selection on that square, then all of them will flip horizontally and it will keep all the same settings because we copied and pasted it. The other animations that we're going to um, pop in is we'll pop in a walking animation uh, and we will also pop in two animations for um, when they're blocking with their shield and when they're attacking with their sword. So if I, take the first frame so i'm going to take it from the right hand side because it defaults to the right hand side when we switch between so i'm going to right click and copy that first frame go to walking right click and paste now with walking we're going to have four frames of animation for the loop you could do it with two if you wanted but i like to put a middle uh, a static standing up between the legs moving you'll see what i mean so on the first frame I'm going to use my selection. I'm going to grab one leg. This leg goes up. This arm swings in. Um, and then the next frame, the head bobs down. And then this frame, this leg goes up. And this arm comes in. Oops. This arm comes in. And frame four, the head bobs down again. Okay. If I look in direction options, I want it to loop. And I probably want it to go quite slowly. So maybe... Uh, between 12 and 25. Let's type 12 in again. And there we go. There's our player walking along. And we can test that quickly. So press OK. Run application. I think I'm quite happy with that in terms of movement speed. In terms of if you think they're sliding too much, increase the movement speed. But let's go back. Right click on player one and edit. And we're going to copy sorry on the walking make sure you've got walking selected going to copy the right direction and paste the left and right click flip horizontal so there we go and like i said we'll add in an attack animation so i'm just going to once again copy frame one from the right hand side copy and at the bottom i can right click and click new and i'll call this animation attack and i can paste so can right click and paste and she can suddenly have a sword appear now wa walking to the right is quite useful to do first because if we need extra space we can use the size tool and make the width we don't want the width up to 32 so we still want it less than 32 so i'm going to go for 28 but none of these check boxes checked or ticked so these are all empty and it will expand to the right so that's why it's harder if you're drawing to the left first and so what I'll do is I will just, I'm going to rub out her arm and I'm going to do four frames of animation. And I will draw the sword. I'm just going to do it with a line tool here. So the sword will start uh, size two, just to get a bit more pixels in. Sword will start at the top and I'll get lower, lower, then lower okay and then add the arm over the top so i'm just going to use the color picker get her shirt color and just draw in the arm and then the color picker get the skin color and draw in the hand Now you can shortcut all of this if you want by using the library bar at the bottom and just pulling in our character. But 
we really want to show you how to make things. So if we press play, it plays so quickly, we can't really see it happen. So I'm just going to slow it down. There we go, and again. And if I loop it, you can get an idea of, yeah, maybe we want it to be faster. So 40, 40, and not looping. That was just to preview it. Okay, let's copy the right-hand side, paste on the left, and right-click and uh, flip horizontally. And then finally, we'll do a, um, a defensive, a, uh, a blocking. So let's call it block. And we'll be using these in, uh, in quite a few sections of time, so, but we'll just add them in while we're here. I would normally say that doing animation stuff happens later, so don't spend long on this. This is just to give you a rough idea of what's happening. And let's copy frame one again and add the detail in at the end. We want to be, we just want to make sure that the, the dimensions are right for the character. So we do something called sort of gray boxing or white boxing where we just fill a solid color. And you could do that here. You could just, you could just write the word block on top. But I'm just gonna give her a shield for this uh, an ellipse tool that's filled. And there she is holding a shield. And copy that way, right click paste, flip horizontally. And we, we don't need to worry about this looping that will happen in the code. Okay, so you can run your application and you can have a quick walk around. You won't be able to attack or block. We'll add that in a moment. Uh, the next thing we need to do is add in obstacles and boundary, boundary blocks to make it not so easy to travel across the world. So let's save that, file and save. So to make the player not be able to get through the world, we're going to have different things like trees or shrubs or things in the way. And we found that um, there's, there's two different ways we can do it. So let's, let's just look at a solid wall here. So let's insert a new object. It's going to be a backdrop object. It could even be a quick backdrop if it's repeating. Um, and let's just call this a wall. If we, if we go into its runtime options, we can make it an obstacle. Now, remember in the free edition, we can have, well, we can have up to a hundred backdrop, different backdrop images, but we can only have 30 active. So there's no point wasting an active if you've just got an obstacle. We can just create a backdrop and set it to obstacle. I'm just gonna quickly, um, I double click there. You can do that instead of right clicking and edit, it'll do the same thing. I'm just gonna quickly generate a wall. Um, just make some brickwork here. And we can always go back and make it look nicer later. Okay, and there's our wall. So this is the obstacle uh, technique. And all we need to do is go to event editor and new condition, player one, just not the template. We should have maybe, maybe we can color in the template just for the fun of it. I'm going to right click and edit um, just so we don't get confused and just make this template a different color. Look at that. It's a brand new character. We'll get to those later for NPCs. But anyway, just so that we can go new condition for our player and we want to say collision with backdrop. Then right click movement, stop. So let's run that. Great. I can't travel through the wall. Works fine. Okay, so now you might have an object that's got uh, a hit area at the bottom that you can't walk through, but it itself you can. So the tree, you can't walk through the base of the tree, but you can walk behind the tree. So we're gonna introduce a new technique here. So we're gonna introduce a new object, active object, and we're just gonna change the way it looks. I'm just going to make it a circle and I found that to be the most useful shape. So there we go. It's a circle and I'm going to also name it sort of uh, maybe boundary, wh whatever you want to call it to suggest that you can't travel through it. So there's the boundary. Now the boundary I'm going to um, in the qualifiers in the events in the qualifiers, I'm going to, just put it into a category just to make things easier for later. So I'm going to edit that and add it to the 
obstacles makes sense. So it's uh, in the obstacle category, that's quite far down in the list. If you click on the list and press O, it should jump to it. Um, and that means that I can then in the event editor say a new condition, if we collide with another object, an obstacle, then right click movement, stop. Now it would work just the same because we've only got one boundary uh, type to say if we hit the boundary, we stop. Okay, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is we're gonna use layers. Now layers are on the side normally. Uh, if you can't find them, you can go to view toolbars and turn on your layers toolbar. And we're gonna add a new layer on top. Now this layer, the objects in it won't be able to collide with objects in other layers. So that's gonna be helpful for us. So we're gonna insert a new object, a backdrop, but we're not even going to set this to be an obstacle. So there's no way that, our, that any collisions will happen. Um, and I'm going to create a, a tree. So I'm just going to clear that and just quickly draw a tree. Use your imagination. Okay, let's fill that. Zoom in to do the finer detail and maybe even add some leaves on it. Okay, so there's our tree. Um, We'll name it as well, just because we're being well behaved. Tree. And currently you can see it's on layer one. I've made a mistake that I should have selected layer two, but easily fixed. If I pull it onto layer two, you can see it's now on layer two, and you can see it's now on top of everything. Uh, if you're struggling to get your objects to align because of the grid, you can use the cursor keys, the arrow keys on the keyboard. So I'm just going to pop my tree there. Um, I'm also going to just, because the boundary at the bottom is round, I'm just going to round off this area here. Okay, great. So we've got a tree, which is a backdrop with no collision. And it's on layer two. Okay. Well, in the, um, if we run our application now, you'll see that our character can walk behind the tree but can't walk through the tree because of that boundary square. Now it might happen that things don't overlap fully. So you might have the tree and you might have the boundary for the tree sticking out the bottom like this. You might not want to see it. So if we select the boundary and go to its display options, we're going to turn it off being visible at start. And that way you can't see it anyway. There we go. So from this point on, be aware you have two layers. We're about to add a third, so still be aware. Um, and uh, layer one is our game. Layer two is for our overlays. And you can also name them. It's quite useful in Click Team. You've got properties for the layer itself. So if I, write, if I select the layer, or, yes, just, just normally click on it, I can call this... Um, I don't know, it's going to be trees, really. <laughs> I'm just calling it trees. And this one I can call uh, game world. Now we're going to add a final layer on top, a new one right on the very top. Now this is going to be for the text, for when characters speak and things happen like that. So I'm just going to change uh, this name to heads up display. But I'm also going to say that it's not going to scroll. I'm going to set the X coefficient and the Y coefficient to zero. Now that's not too important for the text because text naturally doesn't follow the frame, but um, it will matter if you add in any sort of other health or anything to the frame. Uh, well, that doesn't move either, but any active objects. So we want to be on layer three. Good. We're going to insert a new object and it's going to be uh, a string for the text. I'm going to click to put it down. Let's stretch it out and get it to where we want. Get it text options. We're going to change its size. So click on the font. Let's make it bigger. I like it centralized uh, and in the middle. So center there. And that's great. Now, when you get the text on dark areas you might not be able to see it so what i'm going to do after we name it because we're going to be well behaved uh we'll call it speech so so that it stands out we will insert 
a uh, a new object and this time it's going to be an active object because we need it to change when it appears and disappears and its size is going to be the width of the frame which we know is uh, 640 and the height i think i'm just going to make it 80 there and i'm going to double click on it i'm going to clear and this is going to be just a colored bar so i'm just going to do a sort of yellowy yellowy color there and i'm going to name it we'll call it the speech bar right click let's order it all the way to the back so it's behind the text but also i like to make it semi semi transparent so in the display options we can change its blend coefficient to a number anywhere up to 255 that's invisible so less than that so i'm going to go with about 180 there we go and we get sort of a uh, a tinting effect that happens there right but we don't want this to be visible at start much like the boundary so let's turn that off and for the text we're going to do the same we're going to make it not visible at start so that uh, you can't see anything we'll just add a tiny bit of code in here as well we want every time the there's an update to what's shown on screen we want the text to appear for three seconds or so so i'm just going to click on the application and go into values i'm going to add a global string now this means that this string will be true across all frames now it also means we don't have to actually add another object and use up our object limit so let's click new and change from global string a let's call it um text to show and we'll make a new condition that if under special the global string if text to show is different so it's not the same as nothing then two things are going to happen first of all we will um, make the speech bar visible so right click visibility make object reappear then the speech will do two things we'll right click and we'll change its alterable string so we'll change what it says and it's going to match whatever the special retrieve the global string of text to show then we need to show it so right click visibility make object reappear now so that this doesn't trigger all the time we might as well clear the text to show at this point so that it's not true anymore text to show will be nothing so right click set global string text to show to nothing just leave it as it is fantastic now we want it to hide after a certain time so on the timer we'll go to fire event after given delay so after three seconds seems plenty we need to choose what the event name is going to be we'll call it hide text but make sure you leave the um, the speech marks the uh, double double quotation marks there to keep it a valid expression and then new condition on the timer on event and the same thing we need to call it exactly the same thing to trigger oops exactly the same thing for its trigger hide text and then at that point quite simply right click under the speech bar make object invisible and on the the speech itself visibility make object invisible so that both of those become invisible all right well let's test it so we could just say uh, use arrows to move so we run our application and now says use arrows to move and it stays on screen after three seconds it's gone great and we've used that feature um, quite a lot with collecting items and speaking to npcs but for the next bit um, we're going to move on to a whole brand new section and look at the enemies so let's close this and save file and save so let's go and go into our frame editor and add in some enemies we're going to make them from our template because they're going to be the same size so we're going to right click and clone on the template and move that across but we will in the about we will rename it um, this one can be an ogre but i'm going to write enemy ogre and if you write the word enemy before the object it just means they'll all be sorted together or you could use folders but either way it makes it tidier 
we want to do a few things. We want to um, put it in a qualifier. So in the events, let's click on qualifier and edit, add, and we want all enemies to follow the same rules. So we'll put them in the enemy group because that's a sensible name for them. Then we want some values. Now I'm gonna make three different new values. These values aren't global, like the uh, string that we had, which will be the same across all frames. These apply specifically to that instance of the object. So we have two ogres, they could have the same names of the values, but different numbers in them. And so let's, uh, let's set these. So double click, A, we're gonna call health, and I'm gonna give it a default health of maybe three. And B, we're gonna call it aggressive. Now this is how often they attack. And um, I'm going to set that to um, the lower, the more likely they are to attack. So attack of zero means as soon as you touch them, they are attacking you multiple times. I'm gonna set this to 60 because I found that that's sort of every second or so. And then the last one is movement, which we will use to control there, speed and movement and such. We also need to do something within the movement itself. We need to choose that they are bouncing ball. They're not moving at start and we need to give them some deceleration. So uh, I've got a movement of 16, so I'm gonna give it a deceleration of 10. We'll see how that goes and see how quickly it slows down. I'm gonna quickly change the way it looks. So uh, let's do the animations, but we've done this before. So uh, an ogre, I'm gonna, oh, we've already got a green background. So I'm gonna do sort of a, a mud ogre. So there we go. Maybe we'll give it some shorts. Maybe, maybe some blue shorts there and some scary red eyes. Gosh, it's a nightmare. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Right, let's um, copy the stopped and for walking, paste. I'm, I'm just gonna do this walking front on and I'm gonna just do that two frame animation I said that you could possibly do. So one leg up, opposite arm in, other leg up, other arm in, and set that on loop and set it to a slower speed. So maybe 20. There he is. <laughs> Hideous. Right, let's uh, have the attack animation. So at the bottom, we're gonna right click new and right click and rename. Let's call it attack. Doesn't really matter what you call it, it just needs to be, it needs to be the next one after stand up because all enemies will have to have the attack in the same animation. So I'm just gonna grab the stopped. I'm gonna right click and copy and right click and paste and or oh, when he attacks, then maybe his eyes go yellow. And, oops, <laughs> I can't get it. Uh, I'm gonna lift his arms in the air. So if you hold down shift, you can pick up the color that's underneath. So picking up transparent and then picking up. And then maybe a hideous scream, rah. Okay, um, and quite a slow, we want that to be quite slow. So we'll say, six okay there we go that's uh that's enough of the animations for that we'll actually go into how it actually moves so we'll save it and look at movement file and save so at the moment the movement of the enemy they're not moving at start so let's uh let's use the uh, the values that we've set for movement to uh, get the monsters chasing us. So in the event editor, I'm actually gonna make a new group of events. If you right click on number seven and say insert a group of events or right click on the last number, we'll call it enemies. This is just a really easy way of keeping code nice and tidy. You can also deactivate a whole group if you want to uh, remove a whole section of code. But for now, we're just gonna use it for in the same way as folders to keep things tidy. So the first new condition we're gonna do is to limit any of the enemies. So in the enemies, we want to see their position, test position, we do not want them to leave anywhere of the screen. So under that, we'll right click, and this time we're gonna choose movement bounce under enemies because they're bouncing balls, we'll get them to bounce. Uh, another new condition that if any of the enemies, we don't want them going through the boundary blocks, if they 
collide with the boundaries, then we'll get them to bounce while movement bounce. Okay, so now we want them to actually chase you and to start moving. So we'll say a new condition and we'll do a special always. We want to look through every single enemy there is. So if we right click, we can choose, and let me just scroll down, under enemies, under always, right click, count for each object. What this does is the click team goes through anything that's in the category of enemy, it goes through each of the object one by one, and we just need to name it. So I'm gonna call it follow, because it's about them chasing the player. New condition, and under the enemies, we need to do loops on each object, and we just do the same word again, follow. So it's always going to check through every single enemy and it will check each one individually for this rule to happen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click and insert. We want to check the distance. So we're gonna do special compare two general values. We wanna find uh, the distance between the player and the enemy. So if we click on the group enemies and choose position, distance with a point, it's just at the bottom there position distance with a point, it writes out O distance for the group of enemies and it wants to know which, which point and it's gonna be our player, P1. So click on P1, position, get their X coordinate and press tab or select, you know, there's angled parentheses so that that's all selected, but tab will do it for you. And it's gonna be player one's position Y coordinate. Now, if this is lower than 200, which I think works well for our frame, but you can set how, how close the player has to be in order to go part to uh, not be chased or to be chased, then this, this event's gonna trigger. Now that's, for me, that's just a bit too mechanical. So I'm gonna right click and insert a random chance special. X chances are of Y, so one out of 100. We can try that and see how well that works. So one out of 100 that they'll spot you. But that's happening every time the click team is looping through the code. So that might be within a second, um, they will spot you. So then what we'd want to do is we want to right click and direction, look in direction of, and it's gonna be relative to the player. And we also want to right click movement. We want to set speed. Let me scroll along just to, underneath enemies, right click movement, set speed. And we will retrieve the value from the group of enemies, values, AZ, it's the movement. Okay. So always check each enemy if they're closer than 200 pixels and there's a one out of 100 chance they will look at you and then they will move. So if we run the application, I get, oh, there he goes. It's kind of lurching towards me. That one out of 100, I don't like. I'm going to reduce that to make it that they're much more likely. You could even add an alterable value for each enemy sort of about um, their vision or how, how, no, how quick they spot you. So I'm gonna half that to 50, run the application. Even that's too, uh, too slow. I think I'm gonna take it down to 15. 100 was way too high for my liking, but you just said, there we go, yeah. There we go. Puts me in a bit of peril. Ah, it's faster than me. All right, and just caught up. So I think what we need to do is because these monsters can travel, I think we need to set them in some zones. So let's save our work and do some zoning. Now this should be quite easy. In the same way in the first section, we set areas of the world there's going to be areas where you know the ogres live. They live in the forest with the trees, or they live in the mudlands, or wherever. So we need to make some boundary blocks that are specific to the enemies. So we're going to insert a new object, and it needs to be active, and make sure it's on frame one. Now this is on frame three, and our ogre is on frame one. That's not going to work. So in the layers toolbar, I'm going to drag this to layer one. I'm then going to, because I'm not going to add anything to frame three, I'm going to lock it. So I. I won't, uh, won't be able to change things in it. I'm also going to lock frame two for the moment, but if I was to add more trees, I would need to unlock it and add more trees because once locked, you can't move anything. 
So let's go make sure we're selected on frame one. The other two are locked, just freeze. And let's call this, um, you can right click and edit or press F2 like I did. Um, let's call it enemy boundary. Uh, door click on it. I'm just going to make it a solid block of color. I'm going to make it a pinky color. I'm also going to put a red line through it to suggest that you can't. It's a no-go area. Okay. We don't want to put it in a category of obstacle because we want to be able to travel through it. But what we want to do is I'm going to use the paint mode and select enemy boundary. I'm just going to drag out this ogre now lives in that area. Turn paint mode off. I'm just delete that by pressing delete on the keyboard, but we just need to limit it. So in the event editor, we will say a new condition. If an enemy collisions with another object, the boundary, the enemy boundary, then for them, right click movement bounce. But we run into an issue where the player can kind of taunt the enemy by going close to the boundary and the enemy running up to the boundary and running up again and again and again to the boundary. So I'm going to make it that if they hit a boundary, they retreat. So all I'm going to do is after bounce, I'm going to set their speed, movement, set speed, and I'm just going to find out what their, their, their current speed is. Retrieve movement from values, values A to Z, retrieve movement. And I'm going to times it by two. So they move twice as quickly away. So now if I run my frame, there we go. Definitely retreating very quickly. You can choose a, you can do a small number, 1.5 or something. Uh, th but this pink thing looks hideous, obviously. So let's just, in the enemy boundary, let's, in its window, display properties, turn off visible at start in display properties. So now we've got, I'm chasing us, but if we leave the area. So you probably want to make these zones quite big so you don't get this boundary wall effect often. Um, but there we go. We, what we'll do now is we'll work out how we can actually battle the enemy and when they attack us and when we attack them and, uh, how well that works. So, uh, let's uh, file and save. So this is the bit that we all really came for. This is the battling section. So we use the aggressiveness counter to work out how likely they are to attack you. So we're going to say a new condition that if an enemy collision, if it's overlaps another object, so if it gets actually on top of player one, then we're going to right click and insert. We're going to do the X chances out of Y at random. So we're going to say that there's one out of the values of the enemy of the aggressive. So one out of 60 for this, for this case, so an aggressiveness of 20 would mean that they would attack three times more likely. So you could, you could reverse it round in terms of you could, if you want, say the higher aggressiveness, the more likely they are to hurt you by saying, uh, by using the X being aggressive and the Y being say a hundred out of a hundred, but we're going to say it's one out of aggressive. And then it means we can make something very passive and occasionally aggressive if we want. And it's up to us. There's no limitations on us, uh, but we do need to check they're not already attacking you. So we're going to right click and insert under enemies animation, which animation is playing and we'll choose attack and then we'll right click and negate it. So it's not playing. So there we go. Enemies on top of us. There's one out of the chance for aggressiveness and they're not already attacking. Then we want to do uh, change their animation, right click animation, change. Let's move this along so we can see it. Right click animation, change animation sequence to attack. And we want to lose some lives. So that's under player one. So right click number of lives, subtract from lives one from the black joystick player one there. Okay. Um, now we can't see our lives at the moment. So let's go to our frame editor and we can choose where we put them. I, I quite actually like putting them on top of the player. So let's, let's do that. So insert a new object lives. That is, let's pop it down somewhere. Now these lives are way too big. So I'm just going to right click and edit them. 
scale them. And this time I'm going to select all of these, check all these boxes, and so that I can get this down to a much smaller size. Well, that's teeny, but it's fine. I think it will work for what I want. Oops. Yep, there's some teeny tiny hearts. And I'm just going to change the size so it fits in our 32 by 32. There we go. In the event editor, I'm going to, under the always rule, I'll position them. So right click, position, go along again, <laughs> position, select position. It's going to be relative to the player and it's the top left of the box. So I'll pop them up there. There we go. Uh, in fact, actually edit. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I'm happy with that. You can just drag that that little target to wherever you want. So we run our application. Let's watch what happens. There's the ogre really wanting to get to us. There goes attacks. Lost attacking again, attacking again, and we should be dead. So that's that's code in that. Um, we'll put it not in the group enemies. So we can either put it above by right clicking on seven and inserting a, a new event, and it'll put it above. So we could say under the joystick when lives reach zero. It pops there, or we could have just clicked new condition that's not indented. So that 16 down there would have done it. So when lives reach zero, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to destroy our player because the screen is all based around following them. I'm going to make them invisible. Uh, so I'm going to say visibility, make invisible, and we'll change our the text. So if we right click under special conditions for this number of lives reach zero, we're going to set a global string and text to show you died. There we go. Classic. Uh, but maybe press R to restart. If we want, and then we can right click and insert a new event that keyboard from pressing key R, right click under the frame, restart the whole application, not the frame, but the whole thing. So let's see, we can do that. One, two, three, you died. Press R to restart. There we go. If you wanted it to um, to stay up all the time, you could actually change from number of lives reach zero. You could replace that to compare to the lives and see it's a green condition at the moment, meaning it triggers one off as soon as it happens. This one's a black condition, meaning it triggers every time it's true. So it would keep that on screen. That would never clear because as soon as it clears it, it would set it again. Uh, so uh, killing killing enemies, uh, I think that's, uh, and also being able to block. So so new condition, if we, player one, uh, collision overlapping another object, any of the enemies, and if we, if our animation, which animation is playing, if we are attacking and insert our animation compared to current frame of animation has got to number three, which is the last frame of animation for us because I remembered, because if I have a look at the attacking animation, uh, it's got, it says one, two, three, four, but realistically that's actually zero, one, two, three, because it says the first frame is equal to zero. Um, it doesn't there, but believe me, it is. So we've got to the final frame. So we've swung and we've hit. So it's not all the time that we're playing the attack animation. It's at the final hit of the blow. Then at that point, we can right click and alt values. We can subtract from their health one. And then a new condition, if any of the enemies alt for values compare, if it's equal or lower, because you might get a double hit or a, might have swords that do more than one damage in the future. Then, oops, I put that in the wrong place. I'll just drag that across. That should be underneath the group enemies. Then we will destroy them. We will destroy them all. Well, just the one that's got no health. So here's our guy. Oh, we haven't set any buttons. <laughs> haven't set any buttons for attacking. It's going to be an uh, unfair fight. So. I'm just going to show you, if you click on the application and go to runtime options, at the bottom there's default controls. And if you click on keyboard for player one, I'm just going to set button one to A and button two to Z uh, or Z. So new condition, um, 
it's outside of the um, enemies. Let's put it here. So let's uh, right click and we could even insert a new group of events and call it maybe combat. So a new condition that uh, the joystick, read joystick state, we press fire button one, which is A and deselect up. So we press fire button one and let's insert that right click animation. We don't want, which animation is playing? Attacked? No, we don't want that. Right click negate. We can't, so we're not just spamming it. We have to wait to finish. So if we're not playing attack, then animation change, animation sequence to attack. We could even make it so that we stop moving. Um, so I probably want those the other way around. So you can change order by double clicking on things and switching the order and going back to the event editor. So I want to stop and then change animation to attack. So if I run my application, see if I can, there we go. There's my sword. Ah, well, that was quite quick. Feel <laughs> So, uh, I feel what happened there is that, uh, because my current frame of animation was three, it kept, kept it like that. And for several sort of clicks through the code and, uh, it took off all his health while just my animation was on three. So let's set another thing to happen here that we will change our animation on the, uh, on rule 16 for us. When we've, when current frame is free, we will animation, we will restore animation sequence, meaning we'll go back to being stopped. So let's see one, two, three. Yeah, there we go. Must have had a miss hit there. So when it hits, it jumps back to being stopped. There we go. He did some damage. I did more damage. I win. So let's work out being uh, blocking. So it's going to be a new condition. Um, put it in combat. And it's going to be when we hold. So player one's joystick, re joystick. Well, when uh, repeat while joystick is pressed. Excuse me. Fire button two, but not up. And so when we're pressing Z or Z, um, we want to we want to to uh, set our speed let's do that rather than stop we'll set our speed to zero and we'll right click and we'll movement we will uh, animation sorry we will change animation sequence to block okay so now let's run our frame so if i hold down the z and move towards the enemy should bounce off but i have a sneaky suspicion no, just traveling through and still attacking. So that's all down to the fact that our animation block is playing. Yes, it is playing, but it's playing for such a short amount of time. It's dropping back to the stopped animation and then restarting. So we're having sort of this, um, this gap when the player is vulnerable. So let's right click and edit. And we're going to resolve this by going down to the block animation in direction option choosing loop so it is always playing it doesn't finish now if i run my frame i'll have a different issue i'm blocking i'm blocking he's bouncing off bouncing off fantastic i let go of block i'm still blocking because it's a looping animation we'll close our test application we just need to um negate this uh say when we're not pressing fire two so new condition player one joystick Repeat while joystick's pressed, fire button two, and turn off the up. Right click, negate, and then we'll restore um, the player, not the enemy. Right click, under the player, animation, we will restore the animation sequence. So now we finally, there we go. Run at them, block, 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 attack, block, attack. Oh, we died. <laughs> But um, but we are able we are able to attack the enemy now. So let's uh, save that file and save. So a RPG wouldn't be a role playing game if we didn't have some quests, and it wouldn't be a quest if we didn't have items that we could collect. So let's go into our frame editor. We're going to insert a new object, an active object, and pop it down. Make sure it's on layer one, which it is, and this can be. An old shoe, oops, show, an old shoe. Just right click and you can rename it. And then right click and we can edit it. And let's make a lovely, when it needs to stand out, let's make a lovely old red shoe. Oh, it's beautiful. 
the joy. And you can tell it's a shoe. Oops. Smaller size. You can tell it's a shoe. Because look, there's some shoelaces. Great. And I'll just make sure the hotspot's in the center. And let's pop that down somewhere. Uh, inventory items are actually quite easy in terms of the level the frame editor. All we need to do is go into events and let's put a qualifier on it. So click in the blank space and click edit, add, and let's call this a collectible. I think there's one called collectible. Yeah, there you go. Collectibles. Great. Now we need to know if it's in our inventory. So quite simply, we're going to create a active object, new object active. This is where we use up our active objects in the free edition. Uh, it's on layer one. That's great. Let's rename this and let's call it inventory. Now I'm going to right click and edit it, clear it. I'm going to make it a bright color because bright colors, I think are easier to know that they're not in game, but they're just there for us programmers and in for inventory. There we go. You can do whatever you like with it, but just so I can see on the icon what it is. If we go into the event editor, we can say, and let's put it in a uh, in a new group. Right click, insert a group of events. Let's call this uh, inventory. New condition. If the player collides with another object, so P1 collides with another object, and it's a group collectible, therefore they've touched it. Therefore, we're going to add it to the inventory. So we will right click underneath the object and we will say position select position so we're physically going to put it on top of the inventory so you can click relative to and choose inventory or you can just click on it so it's actually physically going to sit on the inventory we also need to tell them that they've got it so let's uh, under special conditions let's right click and set a global string text to show you found oh that's even better because we don't know if it's going to be plural so added to your inventory, but we need to add in what it is. So we're going to add in a string. So I'm going to go to the very beginning before the, uh, the double quotation marks, the speech marks, and I'm going to click on group collectibles. I'm going to get its name. So get the name and then a plus to join them together and a space there. So whatever the name is, it's added to your inventory. Great. Well, let's do that. Run application. If I get the shoe, old shoe added to your inventory. Fantastic. Well, that seemed particularly easy. Um, at the end of the video, I'll run through an advanced way of doing that. But uh, for, now, for now, that's probably good enough. You just need to make sure that your items exist in the world and then you can uh, touch them and they'll get put in your inventory. So, um, We'll save that file and save. We've got things to collect, but have we got people to talk to? No. So let's go to our frame editor and from our template person, let's make a clone, clone object. There we go. Now this little person, let's double click on them. And they are a completely different person because they're now wearing a yellow top. There we go. And black trousers and they have hair. Great, and maybe even a moustache. <laughs> um, maybe a moustache. Oh, maybe they've got something wrong with their face. Ho ho, there we go, great. Let's give them a name, and this name is gonna be actually what they're gonna be called. So this can be Frankie. Hey, Frankie, I kept left for a name, Frankie. Um, as Frankie. Now with NPCs, you can choose several different ways of moving, but the easiest, if we choose movement, change it from static let's choose path movement let's edit the path movement and choose tape mouse meaning that when we click and hold it creates an area so frank is going to walk around going to go near the ogres but not quite and frank is going to go back there okay i'm going to say at the end it frankie does it again but he re repositions so he jumps to where the first one is so he doesn't get out of sync and start wandering off speed 50 frankie is sprinting mate so we, let's select all of these drag around and let's see more meandering at speed four now we need to put uh frankie in a 
qualifier. So we go to events, qualifiers, edit, add, and we've got one for NPCs, non-playable characters. Great, good. We also want to, in terms of values, we want to give Frankie a string of what to say. So Frankie can say, what a lovely day. I'll, yeah, great, that's fine. Great work, Frankie, yeah. So let's uh, go into the event editor and we'll right click on 28 and we'll insert a group of events and we'll call it NPC. So new condition, if the player collision, if it overlaps an NPC, then we want to do a couple of things. First of all, we'll get the NPC to stop. So if I just find here, we'll get movement, stop. The next thing we'll do is we'll get them to say what they're saying. So to right click and we want to set a global string. Now we don't need to keep the speech marks this time because what we want them to say is already there as a string in the NPC values, odd for strings, and string A is what we used. But let's let our character know who's speaking to them. We're gonna add another string to it. So I'm gonna put two uh, double quotation marks or speech marks. I'm gonna put a hyphen and a space, and then I'm gonna add whatever their name is. So let's click on group NPC and find out their name. There we go, in the same way that we, when we pick up an item, but now, we do that. So the NPC will be stopped. Fantastic. But then it should start again. So we'll just do that on a timer. New condition. Click on that. The timer every three seconds to allow them time to breathe. Every three seconds, the NPC will start moving again. So right click movement start. So run application. There he is. There's Frankie. What a lovely day. Yeah, great. What a lovely day. Great. Not useful to our quest, but still a very nice person to meet. Um, so let's save our work and let's get Frankie to give us a quest. File, save. Well, to save ourselves time, I think Frankie will have lost a shoe. That's gonna be the quest that we're gonna have in this game. So let's change what Frankie says. So what a lovely day, but I'm sad I lost a shoe. Great. Um, and there, there, is, there is his shoe, we assume. So let's create the quest for this. And also, I'm going to have it that Frankie gives us something. So I'm going to insert a new object. What could he give us to thank us for finding his shoe? Uh, maybe something as useful as an ice cream. So just create that quickly. And we need to make sure that it's a collectible. So in the events, qualifiers edit, add it to the collectibles, and we'll just also name it, name ice cream. Right, now, because Frankie's gonna give us the ice cream, I'm gonna place this, not in the inventory, because then we'll already have it, I'm gonna place it off screen there, so that it can be brought in for when, he, uh, for when he wants to give it to us. We could also have him create it, but um, we can just reposition it, that would do fine. So this is the basis of all quests work like this. In the event editor, I'm gonna make another new group, so I'm gonna insert a group of events and I will call it quests. And so a new condition, if you collide with another object and specifically not any NPC, but Frankie himself, and if you have the shoe, if that is overlapping your inventory, you've already collected it. So at that point, Frankie, can then change what he's saying. So Frankie can then in his old four strings, we can set what was, what a lovely day, I'm sad I've lost my shoe, to my shoe. You found it. Here, have an ice cream. Great. And then 
for the ice cream itself, we can position, select position, and let's do it relative to Frankie. So relative to Frankie, and we can just drag it. He can put it down underneath himself. There we go. Right, let's just try that. Let's run an application. Frankie, you enjoying the day? Oh, it's a lovely day, but he's lost his shoe. Do you know what? I've just found a shoe here. I'm sure you found it. Have an ice cream. Yeah, right. Got an issue here. He gives it to us and then <laughs> puts it back. It's the same ice cream he's stealing from our inventory at this point. Okay, so it's not working perfectly. I'll show you how and why. So this is happening and, uh, and the ice cream is, is positioned. I'm going to limit it so that he only does that when you don't have the ice cream already. So we could, uh, we could do several things. We could use a flag on Frankie and we could say that when his flag, we could here say that he could have a flag. So on Frankie, we could, and AZ, we could have a flag of given ice cream. And that seems to be the most sensible way. And that if you hit and right click and insert and Frankie's flag is off, given ice cream, then we can set the flag to be on. That's one way of doing it. Another way we could have said, if we if ice cream is not overlapping inventory, then he gives it to you. But this way I think works better across the board. So what a lovely day. He's sad he's lost his shoe. We click the shoe. Found it here, have an ice cream. He says here, have an ice cream, but um, he's not giving it to us. So we could tidy that up. We could just say a new, new rule that if we touch the ice cream, then we can change what Frankie says. So um, multiple strings, we can set his multiple strings through. So glad I found my shoe. Shoe, shoe. Okay. Hey, Frankie, have your shoe. Get your shoe. Make sure you found it here, have an ice cream. Great, ice cream added to your inventory. So glad I found my shoe. And that's the basic premise. The other way that we can do things is we can give them an alterable value. So uh, I'm gonna call this flowers and I'm gonna set it to three and I'm going to change this to give you a next quest saying, I need to find three flowers. Great. So in our game, let's just add some flowers. So we're going to insert an active or in fact, if we just clone the ice cream and rename it because it's all in the name. This is how this works. So uh, flower. And we'll draw that. Go with pansy, some kind. Great. Now we'll add multiple of those and I'll just hold down control, and clone those. And now we can, um, we can then give the next quest. So we could say that new thing when we collide with another object with Frank and Frank's value of given ice cream is on flag is on give ice cream. Then that's when we know he's on the flower quest at that point, we could give it another flag to say when the flower quest is completed. So we could have one character give out multiple quests, but if ice cream is on and we want to check, we've got a flower flower is overlapping the inventory. Now this isn't going to work first time. I want to show you why. So flowers overlapping inventory. Great. Then what we want to do is from him, alt for values, we want to subtract flowers one. So he's counting down. He's currently got in his alt for values three. It will become two when we give him one and one and zero. So we'll also change his alt for strings. We'll set that to say, nice. I just need uh, and then we'll 
add in, so a plus after the uh, double quotation marks, the speech marks, we'll get a string version. So the string version of the value of flowers. We can't mix flower, we can't mix numbers and strings. So we need to change it to a string version. I just need that many number and then add in flowers. Oh. Okay. So if we run our application, I'll show you, it'll look like it's where, oh, I need to get his shoe. I need to find three flowers. Okay, nice. I just need one flowers more. Right. So we've got an issue there and we can use the debug window for this. So the debug window, we can add in an active object and let's add in Frankie. See what's happening. Multiple values, flowers one. Let's restart the frame. So if we get the shoe and talk to him, we can see that he has flowers three. Now, if I collect one flower and give it to him, nice. I just need two flowers more. Great. Get two flowers and give it to him and there'll be an issue. So watch the flowers counter up here. So if I touch him, nice. I just need one more. And then if I touch him again, nice. I need zero more. I need one. Got two issues. The first issue is that no matter how many flowers we have in our inventory, this rule is only being run once. What we need to do is we need to limit how many flowers we're checking. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click and insert that the flower pick up count. We're going to pick one at random. So if we've got six flowers in our inventory, it's only going to pick one of them for the next action that we're going to choose, which is to destroy the flower. So we will have to interact with him three times, giving him a flower each time. And if we've got three in our inventory, it will take one out each time. Final new condition, if Frankie um, alt for values compare to one of the alt for values, if the amount of flowers gets to zero, then he's got, um, he's got all of them. Good, great for him. Uh, and we can alt for values, we can, sorry, not alt for values, we can alt for strings, we can set it to, um have a bonus life and then at that point we can just add one to our life counter so right click number of lives add to number of lives one i'm not sure it makes sense that frankie's wanting flowers and giving out lives we have a, a healer who gives you potions in in the version of xander that we made but just roll with it so we add one to number of lives now the issue is that we're just going to add one to number of lives every time that's true. So what we're going to do at that point with Frankie is we're going to set his alterable value of flowers. Uh, you could set it to a minus number. So you could set it to minus one and then you know it's complete at that point. So let's run through the scenario. Hey Frankie, we'll get you your shoe. Then we'll collect flowers. My shoe, you found it, have an ice cream, great. Get three flowers, just need two flowers more, one more, have a bonus life. Great, thanks Frankie. Have a bonus life, have a bonus life. Uh, we've already got the bonus life. We're only getting it the once, but that's because the ultra ball string is have a bonus life. You could set a timer so that after a second he changes what he says, but it's all to do with just setting the ultra ball string. And that's the way that quests work. Simple as that. So I just wanna show you uh, about unlocking an area and a good way of doing that. So let's file and save. Now, like I said, in the free edition, we are limited with the amount of active objects we can have. So we can only have 30 different objects that aren't backdrop. So with our counters and our strings and things like that, it's all taking away of the limit. And so what you can do is you could use boundaries placed over specific people so if we just clone frankie and just make them look slightly different so uh, maybe some blue 
some exciting pink shoes. Completely different person. So, and rename to um, Freddy. There we go. Uh, I'm going to move Freddy and I'm going to position Freddy there. I'm also going to position some walls around him. So I'm just going to do that. Now, currently we can walk through the NPCs. So right click to stop paint mode. We can walk through the NPCs so we can access this area and it's, it's not really an issue. But what we could do is we could paste a invisible boundary on top of him there. We can order it to back if you want to see where he is. Order to back. I'm going to change what uh, Freddy says in the values rather than what a lovely day. And I can delete the flowers. We're not going to have flowers. He's just going to say, I want an ice cream. Not moving until I get one. Oh, there's a clue. So if we run our application, oh, just forgot he needs to be static movement. Uh, we'll change movement to static for Freddy. We do need to be able to, able to overlap him, so we're just going to use the arrow keys to shuffle him out a bit. So if we run application, it will seem like he's blocking our way. So if we walk this way, I want an ice cream not moving until I get one. But it's actually the boundary block. So this is the basis of unlocking chests, unlocking rooms, any of this. We can then say that if we collision overlap another object and if we're overlapping freddy and insert we have an ice cream overlapping our inventory then we can then destroy the ice cream we can then um move freddy so position select position we can move him so that he moves out the way um and we can change what he says alt for Strings set ultra full string to yum yum. Thanks for the ice cream. Now that's not going to solve the fact that the barrier is there, but we can reference that specific boundary circle in this condition. We can say that if we touch Freddy, we have an ice cream and we'll reference the specific boundary. This boundary is overlapping Freddy. We can then destroy that particular boundary. So if we go to the frame editor, because we've referenced which one, let's just make this visible at start. We can watch it happen. So we can see there's still a boundary down here under the tree, and there's the boundary for Freddy, and there could be others in our frame. And we talk to him, not moving until he gets his ice cream. Let's grab the shoe and get the ice cream off Frankie. There we go. Uh, that works. If you find that they're not saying things at the right time, you can force uh, things to be said by just setting a global string. So we could just set a global string text to show to um, you give Freddy your ice cream. So you can add some narration in there as well. And that's the way that unlocking areas can work. If you've got the full version, you might as well just make an active object that's a door, sort of red door and red key. And if you touch the red door and red key is in your inventory, then do that and you know can destroy the red door or you could have it open multiple red doors that the key doesn't get destroyed. But that's the way that unlocking areas works. And so just build your world. That's pretty much it. In the next section, I'll just run through some of the quirks and the tricks that we used um, to make a larger version of the game. But save your work, file and save. So welcome to the run through of The Legend of Xander, the sort of small quest missions that we've set up uh, that you can have a playthrough. So you can see that we've done much the same. We've got our NPCs, we've set them to path movements, but um, a few quirks that I want to show you in terms of this is that I've got this guy here, the knight, has two different types of movement. Let me show you that. So that once we walk into him, the code is to change 
his movement type. So follow me to the path at the top of this hill. So we change him from a path movement to a bouncing ball movement where he's always targeting a particular square. So he walks into his house. Now, when he walks into his house, we've got that if he, the old knight, walks into a, a boundary block, uh, in our version, I think we've called them uh, no walk block, then he destroys it. So the fact of him walking into the house. We also um, have set up some obstacles in this second layer when they're not obstacles, backdrops that you can walk through. So we've got these shrubs just to break up the area so you can sort of hide behind the shrub if you want to. Um, and we just didn't put any boundary circles or no walk circles there. So that works quite well. We've also, in these, we've got, um, for these little monsters, we've got a drop that when we, oh, I'm gonna die. You can see I've got an inventory, oops, got an inventory shown up here. They drop these um, little helmets. Now, the inventory here, we've got it that you press one, two, three, four. It was a little bit of a faff and in the full version, much easier to do than the free version. But what it is, is it's, it's its own frame where we've got all the objects and we've got this list. And we just say that if you press one, two, three, or four, it selects object one, two, three, or four, and that it changes a string in the global values for use. So our show text one isn't uh, the first string in our version. We've got it down here, number five. And then we've got a use item, which item is in use. So you can set an item in use uh, when you, when you um, select it. Um, and this frame here is ran in this frame here in um, something called a sub-application. It's just locked at the moment. Is just there, so it's an inventory. And running a sub application is not ideal, but it works. Uh, to you can set some indoor areas. So, what we've done is we've set some indoor areas of houses so that when we run our application, click team checks if we're in the house or not. And if we are in the house, which is just a global value, go to room. So I go in here and it goes into room and it's dark, but this room isn't dark. This is the one with the table and chairs. And so that is its own frame and it has some code in it. It doesn't have as much code because it doesn't have all the quests coded in, but it has some code in it of moving. And um, when we start, when we start the event, when we start the frame, if we've gone to room one, it will position us in room one. And then if we've gone from two, it'll position us in room two and do that. So if you're feeling very advanced, have a look through this code and have a go at that. But for your quests, we've got this healer here. If I move ourselves up a bit. And if I try and go to the healer's house, I get told off. Oi, I see you stay at my house and I can't get in. But if we turn on the visibility for the no walks so we can see them, Watch what happens. We've set a bit of code to say that if the healer goes into a certain zone, they just wait for it, walks around, but when they walk up here, then if there is a boundary block overlapping the doorway, it moves. <laughs> We're gonna be waiting. Uh, and there we go. He's not watching, so now we can go in and steal his potions glug 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 <laughs> although he still sees us <laughs> because we still exist the frames are running at the same time um i probably just need to add in a bit of code to say <laughs> that let's find that healer code that um this is the oi i see we probably just need to say that insert and the global values of go to room is equal to zero if I'm not in a room because that gets set to one, two, three, or four, depending on which room I go into. Uh, everything's much the same, you know, um, apart from I've got rather than is overlapping inventory, I've got it that it's in the use of the inventory. Then subtract one from herbs. We need the string value of herbs, more herbs. Um, so it's all much the same. It's just got these extra rooms in, in a sub application at the top, but, uh, 
yeah, it's downloadable. This is the uh, the version of the pink uh, enemy boundary, uh, no enemy walk. Got different types of enemy. There's a character that blocks the path and then moves out the way. Um, just different enemies you can you can collect and uh, uh, different missions that you can work. The way that the dark room works is that in one in one house there's a torch on the wall, and if you have the torch in your inventory, so let's just look at the code. If you've got the torch in your inventory, then at that point it destroys the darkness. The darkness is only a uh, an object on top of things, and it destroys it. So there we go. Um, if you get stuck, just comment, let us know, send us an email, um, retro at impactgamers.net, and uh, would love to see the stuff you create. Take care and enjoy your legends that you create, and uh, hopefully you get to sail north and continue your quest. Bye.